Recently on the Insider SA, we followed award-winning marine conservationist Jean Tresfon on a diving journey into the ocean. This time around, we join him in the sky and learn about how this thrill-seeker is able to document wildlife while controlling a unique aircraft. I've been diving for 30 odd years and, and diving led me into my photography in terms of everybody wanted to know what I was seeing underwater and the only way to explain that was to take a camera down and show people. And diving and flying have a lot of parallels. They both offer a unique perspective on a world that people think they already know. One is being down looking up and the other is being up looking down. Both require a primary activity which is the flying or the diving and the photography comes second. Obviously you have to aviate and keep the plane in the sky before you can think about taking photos and the same with diving. In order to take photos from the sky, he learned how to fly a gyrocopter. Getting into flying is an interesting journey. Obviously you need to do a pilot's license and there are various categories of licenses. A gyrocopter license is a license in its own right. It's equivalent to what's called a national pilot's license. Doing the training and the exams, it took me about four months to get the license, doing it two to three times a week. And uh, I really enjoyed the process. And of course, the real learning starts once you've got your license, which took a little while to get the, the flying to a place where I was comfortable. Then, of course, only did I start taking a camera. And that's when the whole world opened for me with the aerial photography site. Veteran Len Klopper is a chief flight instructor who was awarded the prestigious Don Tilly Safety Award by the Aero Club of South Africa in 2013. The main difference between a helicopter and a gyroplane is a helicopter drives itself into the air by forcing the air down. The rotor is driven by the engine which creates pitch which forces the air down and that in turn forces the helicopter into the air. Our rotors, that little ring there, is only used to pre-rotate it up to about 200 RPM. Then we disengage the pre-rotator. As we accelerate forward, the airflow under that rotor drives the rotor. So the rotor is not driven by the engine or the gearbox at all. It's freewheeling. And we create wind with the propeller at the back by pushing us forward. So as long as we have forward thrust, we can climb. If we lose the engine for whatever reason, we can glide very nicely because we still have airflow coming through the rotor and that airflow continues as we descend to find a place to land. As far as the controls are concerned, it's a normal three-axis aeroplane. So the stick is used to control the airspeed. If you push the stick forward, you go faster. You pull the stick back, you go slower. If you want to climb, you have a throttle and brake assembly here. If you want to go up, you open the throttle. And if you want to go down, you close the throttle. You have rudder pedals, which controls the yaw with this little wheelometer. If that is perfectly in the middle, then it's perfectly trimmed out. If it's off to the side, either side, it needs the opposite rudder to pull it okay. straight. So it's a normal three-axis aeroplane as far as the controls are concerned. Gyrocopters are like no other aircraft, especially the open ones. The best way to describe it, it's like a three-dimensional motorbike. You've got a tiny windscreen in front of you, and you're completely open to the elements. It's a completely raw, elemental experience. From a photography perspective, it's magnificent because there's no wings in the way and wires and stays. There's no windows to shoot through. It gives you an unparalleled observation platform. And to my mind, there are few aircraft better suited to aerial photography. Gyrocopters are probably the safest light aircraft in the sky. And the perceived risk from the general public is a lot higher than the actual risk. It's aviation's best kept secret. It can be fairly challenging to handle both the camera and the plane at the same time. Obviously the flying comes first, so if it's unsafe you don't take the picture. And I've missed out on quite a few potential pictures because I had to concentrate on keeping the plane in the sky. But once you're comfortable and if everything's going according to plan, this aircraft is fantastically stable and it's quite easy to fly and take photos. So very often what I would do is I would either hold the stick with my knees and fly with my knees and then use both hands to shoot. And if the air is a little bit turbulent or a little bit bumpy, normally you have one hand on the throttle, one hand on the cyclic. I would then switch hands, lock off the throttle, fly with my left hand, hold the camera with my right, and then shoot right-handed. And it's not difficult to do. Everyone always asks the question, how do you manage to do both? But it's like anything. When you've done it enough, it becomes easy. That's the amazing thing about this aircraft is it's the perfect way to see wildlife around the Cape Peninsula. You see sites that you otherwise would never have a chance to see. And it's so much more than a big boy's toy. You know, aircraft are typically seen as the playthings of the rich and famous. These aircraft are affordable. They're 
are probably the best way to see the marine wildlife that I see, in fact, the only way. And uh, as such, I use this plane quite a lot for marine conservation. I fly the whale surveys for the whale unit of South Africa and we go count southern rights up the Overberg coast. I've flown the shark surveys for the shark spotters. We fly fish surveys for the fish scientists and it's just a fantastic way to keep track of marine wildlife and see what's going on. When you start out, you don't know what to expect. So you see wildlife and you go, well, that's very interesting. There was a whale there or there was a shark there. Then when you've been flying a bit longer, you see patterns developing and you say, I expect to see sharks at this time of year. In the summer, the great whites move closer to the coast. In the winter, the whales are off the Overberg coast. And then when you've been doing it a really long time, you start to see what's not there. So when you would expect to see something and it's not there, you actually recognize the change in the pattern. And all of that is fantastic data to keep track of in terms of marine science. So in the middle, there's a, there's a shoal of bait fish. You can see the seals going through it and the fish moving around. The seals are busy eating the bait fish and the dolphins are hanging on the periphery and they're going to be feeding as well. I've been diving in the Cape for over 30 years and the flying is a more recent thing. I've been flying for about 11 years now, but I've learned more in 11 years of flying about the ocean and its creatures than I could in 30 years of diving. Being able to see the animals around the whole peninsula, track the patterns, how they change according to weather and climate, has taught me so much more than I would have just diving. Living life on the edge allows Jean Tresfond to make a tremendous contribution to conservation efforts in South Africa. I've had years of pleasure from the ocean and if I can help in any way with the marine science and the conservation angle and give back, that's my goal considered achieved. And uh, perhaps one day there'll be a book out of all of this. A book we would certainly love to read. Through Jean Tresfan's passionate and adventurous capturing of our ocean life, we can appreciate the beauty it's a privilege to be surrounded by.